Good morning and welcome to the Food Justice Film Festival. It is my honor this morning to sit with Dolores Huerta, one of the most influential labor leader and civil rights activists of the 20th century. She's the feature of the documentary Dolores. With Cesar Chavez, she co-founded the National Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers. Ms. Huerta helped organize the Delano Grape Strike in 1965 in California and was the lead negotiator in the workers' contract that created after the strike. Dolores has received numerous awards for her community service and advocacy for workers, immigrants, and women's rights, including the Eugene Debs Foundation Outstanding American Award, the United States Presidential Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She was the first Latina inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993, and she is the originator of the phrase, si se puede. In California, April 10th is Dolores Huerta Day. Um, I wanted to start by asking you what you think food justice means. Um, how does the food justice work that you've done intersect with racial and labor justice, for example? Yeah, and that is a, re a very profound idea. When we think of food justice, I would think that we should say that not only the United States, but all over the world, uh, people should have enough food to eat. You know, that there, we should not have anybody anywhere in the world be hungry, especially our children. And when we know that we have the capacity actually to feed everybody. So it's not just a question of growing the food. It's a, it's a question of distribution of the food. It's a access to food. And unfortunately, so much of agriculture is about profits. It's about making a deal. How much money can you make? And so our food is not grown in terms of uh, thinking, you know, how many people can we feed? It's, uh, it's really grown in how much money can we make, you know? And so we have a lot of acreage that is uh, really devoted to uh, food that you might be, say is used as decorations, but is not nutritious. And we know that food is sacred, that food is nutrition. Food is not quote unquote a deal. When I would negotiate with the farmers, they would always say, well, the deal is this and the deal is that. And I would think to myself, food is not a quote unquote deal. Food is something that people need. And when you see like in countries like the United States of America, where food is plentiful, at the same time, we know that we waste so much food and that the food that we waste could actually feed other countries uh, where people are needy. And I think the other thing that we have to think about right now, uh, you know, I'm in California right now where we have over 700 fires that are burning. And uh, in some of these areas where the fires are, are actually close to agricultural areas. And we have to think about how climate change is affecting our food supply. And uh, there are some crops now that have already suffered from this. And, uh, and, and, and the other things that we have to think about are things like gentrification. Uh, does food justice uh, extend to where people should be able to live? In California, uh, we have the, uh, some of the coast is our richest agricultural land around Monterey. People know about Monterey, uh, places like that, Salinas, which is close by. Well, many people from San Francisco and uh, are in the Bay Area are moving out of the Bay Area because they can't afford the housing there. The dot com people have come in there, you know, uh, people are making a lot of money, and so they're pushing out the working class. So, a lot of the working class is moving into the Salinas area where farm workers live. Okay, so where are farm workers going to live? They're the ones that have to, you know, they have to pick the food, plant the food, and uh, they're going to push it, be pushed into the ocean. <laughs> so you have so many, many things when you talk about food justice, that has so many ramifications that we can talk about. Yes, thank you. I am a California native and I live up here in Northern California myself and I can really relate to everything you're saying about climate change, about the agricultural conditions, about the fires. Um, and it's scary times and it seems like there's some connection between the exploitation um, in the agricultural industry of the earth and, and of the workers as well. Um, and it's just really hard to understand that the people who grow our food are food insecure and they can't access the food and they can't grow or share their own food. So how do we, how do we move forward? How do we end this exploitation and inequity in the food system? 
Well, there's many ways that we can do that. Number one, by raising the minimum wage so that it's a livable wage, uh, because at least in California, farm workers have the same uh, wage, minimum wage as other people do. Uh, helping uh, uh, workers uh, uh, go, uh, be able to belong to labor unions uh, where they can negotiate their wages with the employers. Uh, again, and, and making sure that uh, all workers are covered with health benefits. If we have universal, universal health care, that would definitely take care of that problem uh, so that the workers would really uh, be afforded to have not only a minimum wage, but a living wage. And we know that uh, our wages have not kept up with the cost of living. And when we talk about, you know, there's a lot of talk about $15 as a minimum wage. Really, in California, a, a living wage is more like $40 an hour. $40 an hour. It's not $15 an hour. And so, you know, these are the things that can really be, you might say, changed. Uh, but and, and throughout you know, it's all our society, we really don't respect people that work with their hands. And it's not only the farm workers, it's the home care workers, uh, uh, people who take care of children, child care workers, you know, our janitors, all the people who do everything that they can to keep our buildings clean and safe. And these are all, you might say, essential workers. These are workers that we need every single day to keep us fed, to keep us clean, uh, to keep us safe, but they are not, not seen as that. When we think, how much does a fireman make, for instance, and compare that to what a farm worker makes, you know, they should be equal. And even what doctors make and nurses make, you know, does it like in Cuba, for instance, in Cuba, uh, all of the wages are equal. So a doctor actually makes less money than a farm worker. And when you think about that, it kind of blows your mind. How can it be that a farm worker in Cuba can make as much of a wage as a, as a doctor? Uh, because in Cuba, all education is free. So if you become a doctor, you got your education for free. And then the farm worker that feeds you is important as a person that heals you. And you mentioned sort of essential workers and people who work with their hands and not being respected by our society in pay and in many other ways. And, you know, the COVID-19 has really revealed that about um, how farm workers, for example, are being disproportionately impacted, how Latino communities are being disproportionately impacted. Can you talk a little bit about what, what we're revealing, what we're seeing um, because of the coronavirus? Well, we know that a lot of farm workers had pre-existing conditions to begin with. Uh, again, a lack of health care. We have a lot of diabetes, a lot of hypertension, ob obesity, all of these things that really uh, tend to make them more vulnerable uh, when they're affected by COVID-19. And so this is, of course, but then another big reason is that so many of the workers have not been protected. They were not given the uh, pre preventative equipment that they needed, the PPE, and uh, the employers really... <laughs> And we're very, very negligent about this. And when you think that we, especially in California, as you know, being from California, that you don't have a family farm here. You have agribusiness. You have these big plantations. So a small grower in California probably has a thousand workers. And the employers often, they don't live in the community where the workers live. You might have well, one of the big growers like Dole, you know, the, the company Dole, the pineapple company, they are major landowners in California. For are their offices, probably in Los Angeles or in San Francisco, in the cities, they're not out there in the fields with the workers. And the workers have been subjected, they, and they have been told on more than one occasion, if you don't come to work, you're going to get fired. Mm -hmm. Even though they know that if they come to work, that they are jeopardizing their health. And so, and all of this could have been prevented had people in the first place said, okay, these are essential workers, we need to take care of them, we need to be careful with them. So farm workers have been very adversely affected. I'm in Kern County right now. This is Kevin McCarthy's district. Kevin McCarthy is the leader of the Republican minority right now in the House of Representatives. Our COVID cases are right now today, over 30,000 people have been affected. We now have close to 300 people who have died of COVID. I mean, this is like 10% of the people that live in the county. This is incredible. This is, and because what were, what were they doing? The Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans, uh, uh, you know, following President Trump are saying, open it up, open it up on Memorial Day. And they did. You know, they opened it up, opened up the, the county, and a lot of people uh, got, got COVID. Many people have died, and we are seeing, seeing the effects of this. So, again, and this kind of leads back to the whole issue 
of uh, not, not only worker discrimination, but racial discrimination, uh, because we know that Latinos, Af African Americans, uh, indigenous, our Native American uh, folks, these are the ones that have really suffered the most from COVID-19. Right, and, and I think maybe people don't know necessarily that a lot, a lot of the labor force, especially in farm labor, um, are women. What does this mean for the conditions that they work in? Everything that you're describing, pesticides, the hours, the lack of health care, you know, these are mothers out there. Yes, and of course, they're very susceptible, as you know, to cancer. Uh, we know that uh, so many of the farm workers, men, women, and children, uh, one of a person in my own family uh, has had, one of my son-in-laws had his father, his cousin, and his mother have all died of cancer, you know? And we know that a lot of this is caused by, and in the town where he was raised is a cancer cluster town, you know, where many, many, many people had cancer, uh, babies were born with deformities, and, and this doesn't need to be. If we just put all of the applications of what we call economic poisons, I'm gonna say that word again, economic poisons. The, this is what pesticides are. The pesticides, the fungicides, all of these things that they put on our food to eat, this is what they are. And we need to take that out of the EPA, out of the Department of Agriculture, and we need to put it under health and human services. Uh, and even though, it, and with my work with United Farm Workers, we ban dozens of pesticides. Guess what? They just make new ones. They make new ones and, and, the, and they test them on, on the workers. And so this is so long and something that really can be, can be fixed. Yes, thank you. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, moving, moving out of the agencies, I think, is, is really important. And it's one of the ways we can support better policies and better protections. What are some of the ways your average person can support justice for farm workers and, and others in the labor force and, and yeah, just be more supportive. Oh, there are so many ways. Uh, uh, I just want to dial back just a few moments and say that, you know, we have to think about the racial discrimination uh, and you might say gender discrimination against women also, that this all comes from slavery. And right now in the United States, we are confronting our, our, our slavery past and people are demanding that we do something about it. And so I think we are now at this critical moment where we can say, yes, we can end slavery and, and the remnants of slavery, because this is what this is, the way that we say that we want people to work for nothing, which would be a, which is maybe a farm worker or a janitor or a woman, a housewife, you know, they, they should all work for nothing and, and be, be so-called our, our so slaves. Okay, well, we have to end that type of a mentality, and I think now's the time that we can do that, but we have to call on every single institution, organization, agency, U.S. Department, you know, that we all have to step in, nonprofit organizations, to step in and say, we have to end this and everybody has to do something about it. So I hope that this isn't just a moment where people are kind of solving their guilty conscience and say, okay, we have to do something like respecting the one day strike that the basketball uh, players took, but that we all have to be uh, anti-racist. It's not enough to say I'm not a racist. We have to be anti-racist and do whatever we can uh, to end the racism and the exploitation and the domination of people in, in our society. And I think this is something that we can do. Uh, in the immediate uh, present, we do know that there is an act in Congress called the HEROES Act. Mm -hmm. And this has a provision in it for hazard pay. And this hazard pay would cover farm workers and other essential workers. And even if they are undocumented, which many of the farm workers are, the hazard pay uh, would cover them. So if people that are listening could just uh, pick up the phone or, or do your email and send it to your senator, and especially if you have uh, people that are in other states, in California, we're very fortunate, we have you know, two great senators, uh, but in other states, you know, where people do not have a progressive uh, representation in their Senate, call your senators and say, please vote for the HEROES Act. And here in California, you know, we have uh, laws that we are right now pushing, Proposition 15, uh, which would bring in uh, money to our schools and our communities, uh, about $12 billion from, by, by making the major corporations like Disney and Chevron and Amazon pay their fair share of taxes. How about that? <laughs> Just like all of us, we have to pay our fair share of property taxes, but we want them to do the same thing. Proposition 16 is another proposition which would uh, 
give us affirmative action, which was taken away from us by Republican Governor Pete Wilson. And uh, this is uh, so that uh, public uh, gov government agencies, our state government, and our institutions and like universities would open the doors to people of color and women in public contracts and admissions into, into our colleges. So, so there are things that we can do immediately. Uh, and of course, the biggest thing we want to ask people to do is to vote, okay? We know we have a big election coming up uh, uh, very uh, just, what, 60 days from now. And we want people to vote, and we also want people to participate in the census if they haven't been doing that either, because that not only brings us money and resources, but also gives us representation. Thank you so much. Do you have, do you have hope for the future in this moment then um, that we can ad address these issues of racial justice and food justice and the climate crisis all mixing together? What, what brings you hope? Well, I think uh, people like yourself, all of the young people out there that have been protesting and marching, and hopefully they take those marches to the ballot box, and we elect progressive uh, representatives that will uh, care about these things like climate change. I don't know how anybody can deny climate change. You know, just uh, right here in our own area, in, in Los Angeles, they had 112 degree weather. Uh, in, 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 I don't know if you heard this or not, but uh, down there in, in, in the desert, they had uh, 130 degrees. It's the hottest, the hottest temperature ever recorded on the planet. And that was here in California. That was here in California. So we know that we are in peril and danger of losing our human species on this planet if we don't do something to save it. And when it comes to the racist issue, one of the things I preach literally is say to everybody, we are one human race one human race and the only way that we survived on this planet as homo sapiens who by the way began in africa what does that mean that means we're all africans of different shades and colors that's exactly what that means our mother our mother land is africa and the only way that we survived on the planet is that we had to protect each other you know we had to take care of each other and we had to share and and, and this is what we need to do today we need to share, we need to protect each other, we need to care for each other so that we can survive on this planet and make sure that everyone has the food that they need and that nobody goes hungry and people are sheltered. You know, we have another, another proposition in California, Prop 21, that will allow each uh, locale uh, to be able to pass a uh, rent control laws in, in, in their community. So, you know, I, I have a lot of hope, I have a lot of promise, and it's mostly because uh, persons like yourself that are getting the word out to people and, and all of the activists out there. So we just have to keep organizing and get more people to share the movement. Uh, our movement, you might say, uh, our movement is uh, uh, to preserve our life and to preserve our planet, you know, right now. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do to get the word out as well. Thank you for your time, Lord. You're welcome. Thank you very much. We all, we all, we all would like to say, yes, we can. Si se puede. Si se puede. Well, welcome everybody. I'm here with Neza Chutkutli, and he is going to help um, talk about farm workers and some of the issues that they're facing in the food justice realm. Neza, do you mind introducing yourself and, and who you're with and what you represent? Sure, um, Nes Nesa Walcoyot, but Nesa is fine, Chutkutli, at the Farm Worker Association of Florida. I'm research coordinator there, and I've been with the association since 2016. Thank you. And I'm hoping that you can talk to us a little bit about um, some of the injustices that farm workers face that you deal with in your work. And, and you kind of explained to me earlier about um, how that relates to a warming climate. Um, sure. Uh, so one of the biggest issues that we're seeing with farm workers is that they are uh, facing more and more exposure to heat. And, and it's not just being had, but you know that translates into long-term health effects like um, hypertension, um, long-term kidney damage, um, and just just being dehydrated when they go to work. A lot of them are dehydrated before they even get to work. Most of them are dehydrated by the time they get home from work, 
Um, so that just puts them at an increased risk of, of um, heat related illness and all the, all the long term effects associated with that kind of heat exposure. Yeah. And do you see a connection between the depletion of the environment and natural resources and how the food system is treating people who work in it? Yes, I, well, um, we as an organization um, are treat the way that we see the food system as exploitative and we see that translating into how we treat workers as well. So we, our food system is, operates um, under the assumption that, that our resources are just going to have to be exploited, right? And, and that goes for the soil and we just use it until it's depleted. And, and that also translates into how we treat our workers. We just sort of use them until they're depleted. We try to extract the most out of them until they are no longer usable to us. And, and we, we see that not just in the way that they work, they, they really basically work themselves to exhaustion and, and um, but we, we don't offer them benefits, we don't offer them health care, and so those kinds of things end up having a long-term effect on, on not just individuals, but their extended family networks, too. Right. I think you mentioned to me that a third of the farm workers are women, and this has a particular in impact on them with the methods of production and pesticides. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, a lot of, a, a lot of Pesticides are uh, cause neurological damage, and um, I, I know of some farm-working women who have ended up having miscarriages or birth defects in their children because of um, exposure to pesticides during their pregnancy. Uh, and it's it's a real problem for a lot of, of people because they have to make a living, and they can't take any time off to while they're pregnant so and if that's their job they they have to go out there and, and put themselves at risk um and and it's been proven that that some of these pesticides they, they cause that long-term neurological damage and and uh especially young children and and, and unborn children are uh, uh more susceptible vulnerability to damage from pesticides what is something that you wish that more people knew about the experience of being a farm worker in this country? Um, no, there's so much. I, I wish they would know how, how hard they work, um, that they don't have a lot of benefits, that they don't get a lot of days off, and even if they were allowed time off, um, they they can't afford to take that many that much time off. Um, um, I wish they knew, and I I feel like a lot of people know it, but it, it doesn't impact them directly. Uh, but a lot of farm workers are not covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, so they don't get paid overtime. Um, so we have a uh, piece rate system where they get paid based on what they pick uh, for a lot of, of the crop uh, industry but uh, what that translates translates into for for workers is that they literally drive themselves into um, exertion and and but more exertion that than they should be driving themselves into so they they increase their risk of being affected by heat stress just because they want to make that, that money. I mean, if they don't keep up, then they don't really make much and it really reduces their ability to, to make barely minimum wage. I think about 60% of farm workers live uh, under uh, the poverty line and they're hardworking people. And so everything we're doing in the environment in our you know, food production methods is impacting farm workers and their vulnerable communities and their families. Um, what do we do to address this problem? What, what are some of the things that your organization does, your work, and, and what can uh, we do? Um, 
Well, we are we are working on raising awareness about the dangers of, of heat stress, but I think um, more importantly, I feel like we have to change the, the food system, and that is something that the Farm Work Association of Florida is working on, uh, just raising awareness about um, the, the extractive nature of our food system and um, and maybe moving away from a monocrop. Um, uh, agricultural model to to a more organic and and yes yeah, sure organic uh, in the sense of uh, fewer pesticides and, and fertilizers but but also organic in the way that it um, develops right like at the community level so that we have more community-based agriculture with uh, multiplicity of crops to being raised together in a way that they complement each other and they are able to regenerate the soil. And so um, we call that agroecology, but it's uh, it's a concept that's, it, the concept of agroecology is relatively new, but it's really a, a new name for the way that agriculture was practiced for thousands of years, it's just recently been like in the last couple of hundred years that, that we've seen this rise in, in in profit-driven agriculture instead of, of uh, food-driven agriculture. And so that's, I think, it's, it's a, it sounds like a simple idea, but it's, it's really daunting to try to change the, the whole, the way we've been operating for hundreds of years. But I think we need to start making some real changes or, or our children and grandchildren are not going to be able to reap the benefits of a um, uh, more sustainable food system and uh, <laughs> unintended pun, but <laughs> I was uh, trying to say that uh, the, there, there's a real benefit in in, um, in using a more sustainable, in relying on a more susta sustainable agricultural model. And yes, our children will have, uh, uh, will be able to rip I read that through both figuratively and, and literally. Okay, thank you. That you'd like to do that? Well, um, as a farm worker organization, I think uh, we, we have to talk about some of the other issues that, that farm workers are exposed to, um, um, like, like wage theft, like, uh, of course, we, we mentioned pesticide exposure. Um, and the fact that they don't get paid overtime, but a lot of times they they live in like we're relying on an imported labor, uh, uh, increasingly so with uh, with H two O. We we call them guest workers. Um, although, as some scholars have suggested, uh, that's not a way to treat a guest. <laughs> so. Um, but the way we treat our, our workforce is just we, we're placing them in really vulnerable they're already coming from a vulnerable situation and it's sort of the result of, of expanded expanding market networks that have sort of driven immigration driven people out of being able to grow food in their local plots to where they have to migrate um, to first world countries but here specifically in, in the united states we're seeing that as a result of NAFTA and then um, increasing intervention in Central America. So most of the farm workers that we have in the United States are of Latin American descent now. Uh, and we also have some, at least in Florida, we have some some Haitian farm workers. And um, I know out west there are also uh, um, Asian farm workers, especially Filipino. But um, these issues are sort of coming from from world economy is driving migration as uh, with as a strategy for people to survive so so we end up with well, workers here in the United States who come from other parts of the world and um, our reliance on this labor is sort of, of uh, we, we tend to demonize immigrants in this country very much but I think we, we're not realizing that a lot of this imported labor comes from 
uh, global processes that have driven them here. And a lot of these processes are uh, have been created by first world, world economies that are creating deplorable conditions in at home for a lot of these workers. Um, so my point to all this is that uh, uh, workers um, um, are already coming from, from a vulnerable situation and then we're bringing them to um, this country to work and instead of allowing them to thrive, we put more obstacles and put them in more vulnerable situations by giving them few protections, um, ac little access to healthcare, um, crowded living conditions. So uh, especially now when we have a, a pandemic, our, our guest workers um, end up living in really overcrowded conditions, but it's not just our guest workers, we also have um, th there's a real shortage of affordable housing, um, at least here in Florida, and I think it's also the case in California. Yes. Um, yes. So it's it's really uh, well, <laughs> it's it's a big problem in California, but I think you know, especially for for uh, in rural areas, uh, there's also no 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 real affordable housing, and so um, workers end up living with extended family. And that it's, it's not just the labor camps that we have to worry about, but also other, uh, just like what we call community workers, uh, domestic workers, they are also living in crowded conditions because they don't really have an option. They, they have to crowd and live in different, um, live in the, in the same house with uh, an extended family network. And that's making it especially diff uh, dangerous during the COVID pandemic as well, right? Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's making it harder for for families to isolate to self isolate. Um, if if one individual becomes infected, it's really likely that the rest of the family is going to also become infected. And where can people learn more about your organization and, and how to get involved? to support your work? Um, well, we have an online site. Uh, it's uh, floridafarmworkers.org. Um, and there's a donate button there if you'd like to, to donate. Uh, but if you want to take more um, active uh, involvement, we also have, we're, we've been driving a heat stress campaign where we're trying to make the Florida legislature aware that um, heat stress is is real and it's affecting farm workers and not just farm workers but a lot of the other workers who work outside like the construction workers and i know roofers have like a really uh the, in really overtaxing exposure to to heat um, now having said that the widely known statistic is that farm workers have um um, how widely known it is, but at least in, in my circle size, that farm workers are 20 more likely to die from heat exposure than other workers. So, um, so if you can visit uh, floridafarmworkers.org, um, you can find out a little more about what we're doing. And we're also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. What else? We, we have five offices. Uh, so we're a statewide organization. Uh, our main office is in Apopka, which is just outside Orlando. And we have one in Homestead which is just outside Miami. And our other, other three offices are in like really rural areas. Uh, um, and I can mention their names, but they're not, they might not ring a bell to anybody who's not from the area, but uh, Felsmere and uh, Pearson and Immokalee. Um, so, so we have a presence in the state, but sometimes it's not enough. It's, it's a very underrepresented group. Well, thank you, Neza, for all you do, and thank you for being with us this morning. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Welcome to the Food Justice Film Festival. Today, we're sitting down with Alfonso Chavez, Alfonso is an intergenerational Tucson community activist and organizer with a focus on cultural education, social environmental food justice, art, and sustainable agriculture. As an AmeriCorps Vista Flowers and Bullets and member of People's Defense Initiative, he organizes with indigenous community spaces to combat capitalism, environmental apartheid, 
racial inequity in all forms of social stratification as effects of colonization that greatly impact our community. Through our collective efforts, he envisions the liberation of all oppressed people with a more healthy, just, and functional society. Welcome, Fawns. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's quite a background. I'm so excited to talk to you um, and, and lofty goals. And I, I really am looking forward to hearing about that and, and having you break it down for us. Um, can you tell us more, just to start out, what you've done with Flowers and Bullets and kind of what that organization is for people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so Flowers and Bullets is a collective of organizers reclaiming and amplifying our cultural roots through sustainability, art, and rebellion to liberate, heal, and empower our community. And so with that comes addressing concerns um, that we face as underserved people, oppressed people, and that's, you know, things like food insecurity, unequal pay, displacement, poverty, police brutality, and, and all of these um, effects that we see of um, injustices as, um, as kind of like the side effects of this society. Yeah, and so my position um, with Flowers and Bullets was um, an art crew coordinator and working with community to address issues such as those. And where does the name Flowers and Bullets come from? So Flowers and Bullets is kind of a play on duality of the term and so as uh you know coming from the backgrounds that we do from indigenous backgrounds um there's a there's a lot of um the ideology of balance and so we recognize that within our communities even though we face a lot of the complications and the issues that we do there's also beauty within that and so we consider the bullets to be um, the complications and, and, and the conflict and the resilience and resistance and the flowers is what we create out of that, you know, mm -hmm. the beauty that's within that and that comes, um, you know, the crop production, that comes the culture, the identity, the, the artwork and, and all of those things. That's great. So um, maybe tell us more for people who aren't familiar as, you know, well, with the Tucson community, what needs that an organization like Flowers and Bullets and, and other work that you're doing, what, what needs is it meeting that makes the Tucson community so unique? So Flowers and Bullets is located in Barrio Centro, which is just like um, every underserved community has uh, various complications. And so um, the work that goes on there is just ways that, that we can address many of the concerns that I mentioned before. And so there is um, a community space that's in, in production currently that was originally a, an abandoned school. And so Flowers and Bullets is, a, is working to transform that space into a community center for crop production and education and, and all of those things to address the many concerns that exist. And so for, for youth, it's great because it provides an alternative for a lot of the the issues that may be going on whether it be at home or you know in the streets and so um but but you know it's definitely something that's beneficial for folks of of many backgrounds and so it's just a, a space that's creating a healthy environment for community and and doing a lot of work to address a lot of those issues mm -hmm. do you feel like there, there are food deserts in that area that, that are areas where people are not getting access to fresh and healthy food well, um, there's, there's, a, there's an issue, a complication with the term, you know, food desert, you know, because um, as we all come from, from Tucson and, and that's considered a desert, but we don't consider that anything that comes from a, sen from a sense of like lacking, you know, and that's oftentimes how that reference is used as far as food desert, you know, our desert is bountiful, you know, from our, from our wild harvest and the, and the crops that we're able to produce, we're actually one of like the mecca of, of food production because we're able to to produce all year round because of our seasons mm -hmm. and so um but the um many of, of our communities you know we don't have access to a whole foods or natural grocers or any of those kind of specialty grocery stores to get that you know top quality um produce or even just you know any sort of food for that matter and so there's definitely a need within our communities to be able to 
create accessibility to those things. And a lot of times that has to come from a grassroots level that has to come from within. And so um, being able to kind of tap in to our traditional concepts and, and our history and, and traditions, you know, you're able to tap into some of those practices that, that we've been working with for many generations. Uh, can you talk more about um, how you get into these issues with art? You have the art background, you said you were an art coordinator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think with art, that's just another way for us to use something that's very captivating and, and attractive to the eye. And, you know, artwork has always been a way for us to communicate and kind of tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that goes back as far as hieroglyphs and petroglyphs, you know, we're very, very, um, we're vis very visual learners. And so it's, it's kind of using that as a way to navigate these, these issues that we talk about and to be able to express those things. And a lot of times that's told in like our murals, you know, um, you see, you see images of, of corn and people working in the fields and, and a lot of mural work and things like that. And so using artwork as a tool and as a way to, to captivate your audience and to get folks engaged and to be able to present this other information that's also very crucial. And you seem drawn to working with youth uh, particularly, is that right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. How, how do you do that? How do you approach that? What do you get passionate about in terms of working with art and youth and these issues? Um, for working with youth is, is, you know, it's different. And I think a lot of people see that as something that's complicated or some sort of barrier. They have a hard time kind of connecting, but I recognize them as essentially a reflection of myself. You know, um, I come from the same background. I, I identify with them. I don't see them as like an enemy or I don't see them as being ignorant or that they're strangers or you know, anything like that, like, I, those are our kids, you know, those are those are who are going to grow up and provide for this country and kind of take things to the next level. And so I try to, um, I try my best to honor that and to honor them and, and their experiences while kind of creating an environment that, you know, it's something that we can all benefit from. Like, you know, I, I learned so much from them and hopefully they learn a lot from me too, you know, and I think that it's important to keep that in mind um, because I think that there is a, a disservice that our traditional education system, our more current education system has done for our youth. Mm. So what are they most, what are, what are young people inspired about? Like when you're working with them, how do we connect to um, cultural issues and traditional food and identity and you know, all the challenges that we face in having a just food system. Um, the younger generation has a lot of challenges ahead in, in, in creating a more sustainable uh, place-based consciousness and, and, and sustainable life choices, right? So I'm just wondering what it is that, you know, um, they're passionate about, what you're passionate about working with, and, and maybe what you're looking forward to in the future. Yeah, I think that um, I think that our youth are, you know, they're brilliant beings. I think that they they do take interest in a lot that that's current, you know, especially a lot of those issues that I mentioned because those are things that are that's reality, you know. And and I, m I mentioned that a lot of folks, especially instructors, find it hard to relate to them, and it's something. Um, it's something that I find is overlooked. That's, that's a very crucial piece and kind of the foundational piece of working with youth and being able to help them understand how relevant this information is. You know, when I was younger, I didn't feel connected to my education. I, I couldn't identify with who I was told were my forefathers or what I was told was important. I, I couldn't draw that connection because I felt like I was being talked at constantly. And I didn't feel that, you know, this is something that is a part of me or that I could identify with or, you know, anything of that sort. And I feel that that's the way that we need to present this information to youth and 
and using things that are captivating, as I mentioned, you know, things that, that, that they find interesting, things that are relevant to them, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the instruction that, that we use is, is super outdated, you know, and, and, and distant, a lot of it comes, a lot of that education comes from places like Europe, and, and for whatever reason, those, those um, teachings are valued much more than the teachings that we have here and in, in that shared at home. And so finding a way um, to bring that, that, that information to them in ways that they recognize it and that they see themselves in and find important and, and yeah, and, and it connects, you know? Yeah. And so what, what, what are some of those things we can talk about a little bit more like within the indigenous and Latino communities in, in this area mm-hmm. that are um, not being heard by enough people, you know, in terms of traditions and, uh, what kinds of things would you like to see change, uh, you know, so that this becomes more normalized and, and more of a cultural value, and get away from Eurocentric views? I think that a lot of that comes with education, you know. I think that a lot of times um, these people are overlooked, you know, our history, our culture, and and it's not valued. I think that there is... Um, an issue of white supremacy that exists within our education as far as and as well as our our society as a whole and so we need to find a way to provide equity to that you know and and make sure that our educators are educated as well you know in that field because those are the people that that will be assisting these youth and that largely are um, within the education system and so making that a part of the curriculum you know and understanding that you know where does the 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 concept of zero come from or irrigation or you know hydroponic systems and all of these things that that have been brought um to the table from various cultures you know and i think that oftentimes that's overlooked and and we don't place value on that as well as the people um you know when you talk about the agriculture system and farm workers and i don't feel that people value that profession as they do other professions, you know, that are just just as um, important to not only our country, but the world, you know, the people that that provide the food and, and that do that labor and that essentially sustains us, you know, as a people as a, as a yes, yeah, as, as folks who who live on this planet. And so I think that kind of honoring and respecting and finding ways to inform people of of that information and and knowing where our food comes from and how we're sustained you know is something and and respecting those folks too and making sure that that um that they're supported in in their field uh, rather than being exploited and and you know all these other issues that and complications that come with that especially as we get into undocumented folks and i think that by being educated and valuing these things it changes our whole perspective, you know, it, it changes the way that we view these people. It changes the way that we view food. And this is just one topic, you know, you may you may reconsider the things that you eat. You may reconsider um, how it's grown or where it's grown or why it's grown and by who. And and you want to learn more, you know, and, and you'll, you'll be more cautious and conscious and alert of those things. Absolutely, that's really well said. Thank you so much. What gives you hope? Is there anything that you have hope for for the future that maybe we will be more honoring and more inclusive and reconsider our food systems and integrating diversity and equality? I think um, for me, it's like, it's largely community organizers, you know, Um, laborers, uh, the continuation of of our traditions and, and our education and, and seeing that presented in, in those healthy ways that I mentioned, um, our resilience, um, the youth, you know, especially because they will be who carries that information and all of that knowledge. And it's kind of just the continuation of that. And it's, it's an ongoing thing, you know. Um, I think that those are the people that, and, and not only are those the people, but I think that that, you know, understanding um is what sustains us as a culture and provides a lot for this economy for our society and beyond so what's next for you 
Um, well, more currently, I've been kind of expanding on my social media platform and inviting folks to kind of venture on this walk with me on this journey of kind of exploring, um, you know, issues within um, our society, within agriculture, um, and around food. You know, I love I love to cook. I, I have a lot of like uh, plant based background that that I like to experiment with, and so um my my instagram is fonz underscore 520 i have a tiktok that that a lot of folks have been attracted to and that one's fonz 520 but i'm also um i recently joined another organization here in town called pdi uh the people's defense initiative and so much of my efforts will be going towards housing issues poverty addressing gentrification and stuff of that sort and so that's kind of like my new venture and that's that's a big focus in my life right now and so i'm excited for that awesome okay so if people want to support you can you say your instagram again and your tiktok yeah um my tiktok is fonz520 f-o-n-z 520 and my instagram is similar except there is an underscore so it's fonz underscore 520 and so that's my yeah social media Okay, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you.